this morning. Calvary. Oh, what a blessing. I'm sure glad I know the Master. I pray this morning that you do as well. And if not, would you consider the Master today? Would you consider meeting him at the foot of his cross? What a blessing, what a blessing. We're moved this morning with thoughts of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and what he has done for us. So would you join me this morning in the book of Mark? The book of Mark, chapter number 15. Mark 15, Mark's Gospel, chapter number 15 this morning. This morning, uh, we'll look again at a journey. Last week, we began a journey of hope. If you remember last week, I, I did things a little bit out of order. We looked at Palm Sunday last Sunday. And of course, we know that today is Palm Sunday. This is the day that uh, traditionally, listen, Jesus Christ would ride into Jerusalem to be presented as king. What a blessing. He is our king. He would be rejected. But boy, what a king. What a king. So today we'll continue on that journey. We saw the applications last week. We saw how the crowds would reject him and many would, would, would throw their coats and their jackets, but boy, oh boy, the vast majority of folks rejected Jesus Christ on that day. And can I say that even today, the vast majority of folks are rejecting Jesus Christ, even this hour. This rejection of that week would lead to a place that we'll find ourselves at this morning, the cross of Calvary. That's where their rejection would lead. Over the next week in Christ's life, he would uh, be with his disciples. He would spend some time there in the garden. And they would pray. He would pray so intensely that blood drops pour from his forehead. He would be betrayed by Judas for 30 pieces of silver. He'd be denied by Peter. He'd be arrested. He would be tried. Our perfect, sinless Savior, charged with blasphemy, lied on, rejected. He would be beat. He would be brutalized. He would be butchered. He would endure more suffering than any human being has ever gone through. Why? Why would a perfect, sinless Savior do that? Love love. I say something this morning, listen, he loves you more than you can ever imagine. And he loves me more than I could ever imagine. Jesus Christ loves the Father and is obedient to the Father to the point it took him to the cross to pay the sin debt for humanity. Willingly lay his life down so that you and I could have life. Isn't that amazing? The love that Jesus Christ showed to us. This morning we'll examine Mark's account of this crucifixion. Mark's gospel displays Christ as a servant. So this morning we'll see the servant make his way to the cross. And I pray that this morning it would move in our hearts, it would stir in our hearts a new love for the Savior. That's my prayer this morning is that when we walk out those doors in the back here in just a few moments... We'll love him more than when we did when we walked in by seeing what he's done for us. Uh, this morning, may we take a journey to the foot of the cross, to the foot of the cross. Join me in Mark 15, verse number 1. And straightway in the morning the chief priest held consolation with the elders and the scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold, how many things they witness against thee. But Jesus yet answered nothing, so that Pilate marveled. Now at the feast he he released unto them one prisoner, whomsoever they desired, And there was one named Barabbas, which lay bound with them, that had made insurrection with him and had committed murder in the insurrection. And the multitude, crying aloud, began to desire him to do as he had ever done unto them. But Pilate answered them, 
saying, Will you that I release unto you the king of the Jews? For he knew that the chief priest had delivered him for envy. But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye then that I shall do unto him who you call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, Crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried the more exceeding, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content to the people, releasing Barabbas unto them, and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it upon his head, about his head. And began to salute him, Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed. They did spit upon him, and bowing their knees, worshipped him. When they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him, put on his own clothes on him, and led him out to crucify him. And they compelled one Simon, a Cyrenian, who passed by coming out of the country, the father of Alexander and Rufus, to bear his cross. And they bring him into the place Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. And they gave him to drink wine mingled with myrrh, but he received it not. When they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them, what every man should take. And it was the third hour, and they crucified him. And the superscription of the accusation was written over the king of the Jews. And with him they crucified two thieves, the one on his right hand, the other on his left. And the scripture was fulfilled, which saith, and he was numbered with the transgressors. And they passed by, railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise, also the chief priests mocking said among themselves, With the scribes he saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ the King of Israel descend now from the cross that we may see and believe and they that were crucified with him, reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice, saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And some of them that stood by when they heard it said, Behold, he calleth Elias. And one ran and filled a sponge full of vinegar and put it on a reed and gave to him to drink, saying, Let alone let us see whether Elias will come and take him down. Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And when the centurion stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and he gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. There were also women looking afar off, among whom Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the less, and Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him and many other women, which came up with him unto Jerusalem. This morning I'd like to bring a message entitled this, A View from the Foot of the Cross. A View from the Foot of the Cross. Let us pray together. Father. Lord, we love you today. And Father, as we read the account of what your precious son went through for a dirty, rotten sinner such as I, Father, we're moved. Father, would you help us today as we view events from the foot of the cross? Father, may we apply them to our lives. Father, maybe there's someone here today who is by faith and never received Jesus Christ, who has rejected him all along life's journey. Father, would today be the day of salvation. Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in our midst this morning. 
Lord, we love you. We thank you, Father, for loving us. In Jesus' precious name, we do humbly pray. Amen. Rembrandt, one of the most famous artists our world has ever known. On one occasion, he painted a, a portrait, a painting, that depicted three crosses. On the middle cross hung Jesus Christ, the two thieves to the side. And on the bottom of this painting, you see folks standing there, some uh, appearing to be displeased, some in agony, some mocking. And I'm no art, art expert by no means. But the art experts of our day will say that there's an obscure person that he painted on just the outer edge of this painting. Most would agree that this was a self-portrait of Rembrandt himself at the foot of the cross. Now why would he place himself there? The way that the ones who, who know more about art, the ones who know more about Rembrandt would say by his testimony, he saw his sin nail Jesus Christ to the cross. He saw, when he looked back at the cross, he saw himself there. And can I say something, friend, that you and I ought to envision ourselves at the foot of the cross. Our sins hung our Savior. So may we see ourselves there this morning, finding ourselves at the foot of the cross. I'm going to ask a question this morning. When is the last time that you and I placed ourselves, our minds, at the foot of the cross? Listen, when you were saved, that's where you met Jesus. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's, where, that's the only way You'll find eternity in heaven is through Jesus Christ at the foot of the cross. But as a Christian, when's the last time we went back there and looked at that cross? Looked at the pain, looked at the turmoil, looked at the brutalized Savior hanging on that cross. So this morning, may we see some things. May we see from Scripture today a few scenes from the cross. And may these views encourage us to love our loving Savior even more. Notice with me first. The first view that we'll see as we gather at the foot of the cross is rejected grace. Rejected grace. Notice with me in verse number 11. Verse number 11. Here Pilate has presented Barabbas, a wicked, vile man. Murderer. So you have a murderer or you have the savior of the world. Perfect, sinless. Verse number 11, the Bible reads, But the chief priest moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. We see the crowds here rejecting Jesus Christ. This group here who stood and called out Barabbas are rejecting grace. Notice the chief priest moved them. Notice now with me in verse number 13, And they cried out again, Crucify him crucify him it has been said that this is one of the most torturous and barbaric forms of punishment the pain inflicted on individuals our minds can't imagine there's a, a word that we use quite often the word excruciating I'll give you a little history on that word excruciating it's from a Roman word and it meant out of the cross I've used excruciating before in my life. But I've never felt the pain that Jesus Christ felt on that cross. I've never felt that out of the cross pain, the beatings before, the manner the individuals would be hung on this cross. Listen, their backs would be torn, shredded. In most cases, they would be tied to the cross in such a manner that the tears on their backs would cause them to lunge forward thus making it impossible to breathe. Most folks who died on the cross died from lack of breath, suffocating as they hung. Yet this crowd sees our Savior crucified. Crucified. Notice verse number 14, Then Pilate said unto them, Why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out, The more exceeding, Crucify him crucified our God our Savior 
the crowd seething chose to crucify, rejecting grace. Notice with me in verse number 16, not only did the crowd reject grace, but notice in verse number 16, and the soldiers led him away to the hall called Praetorium, and they called together the whole band. See, these soldiers led him away. They're following the orders and rejecting grace. They're doing what their commander has commanded them to do. But notice what they do. Notice verse 16. And they called together the whole band. You see, they wanted everybody to take part in what they were about to do. The atrocities that they were going to commit, they wanted everyone involved in. That word band, it would mean between 200 and 600 men gathered there to humiliate, to beat, to mock our Savior. As we look at these next few verses, and the soldiers led him away to a praetorium, and they called together the whole band, and they clothed him in purple. Purple represented royalty. They're mocking him by clothing him in purple. They plaited a crown of thorns. Listen, this isn't the briars that you and I know about. Listen, hunters and folks who mess around in the woods, we, we know what a briar is. We've been stuck by a briar before. Listen, our briars pale in comparison to the thorns that they stuck in our Savior's brow. Four to six inches long. Blood pouring down his face as they rejected grace. And began to salute him and hail the king of the Jews and they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit on him. Bowing their knees worshipped him. They're mocking our Savior. Rejecting the grace. Beating him. Then notice with me verse number 22. And they bring him into a place, Golgotha, which is being interpreted the place of the skull. This was a place of death, my friend. This is where they took the, the most brutal criminals. A rocky outcrop on a hillside. Blood stains all around. Listen, it wasn't a pretty picture. The soil is bloodstained. As we look from the foot of the cross this morning, put ourselves there. Look around, see the blood stains everywhere. The smell of death is in the air. That's where they took our Savior. That's where they took our Lord to a place called Golgotha, rejecting grace. Here, this place, they crucified our Lord. They would offer him drink. They gambled for his garments. They inscribed an accusation above his head the whole while mocking him, rejecting grace. Not only did the crowd reject, not only did the soldiers reject grace, but notice the bystanders. Verse number 29. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, All that thou destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days. This crowd who had gathered these bystanders that word railed it means to speak reproachfully to speak evil of to blaspheme that word mock it means this to play with to trifle with can I say something there's folks today who are still doing that to our Lord and Savior just the other day I read on Facebook of a, of a, of a person an individual mocking God Apparently someone had witnessed to him. I don't know, it may have been one of our folks who had witnessed to this individual. But they were mocking the witness. They were mocking an eternal lake of fire. By their own words, here's what they said. They, they told me that if I didn't get saved, I would go to an eternal lake of fire. Sounds like a party to me. That's their own words. There's folks today who still reject our Lord and Savior. Still revile Him. Revile the work that He did on Calvary's cross. Rejecting grace. Isaiah 53, 3. He is despised and rejected of men. Isaiah speaking of our Savior. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and was hid as it were our faces from Him. He was despised and we esteemed Him not. Well, that's happening today. It's happening right now folks despising our Lord he would tell his disciples if the world hates you you know that it hated me before it hated you Boy, we see this hate don't we 
as they mock him, as they uh, rail him, as they ridicule him, our Savior. But notice, not everyone there rejected grace. There was two thieves there, wasn't there? We know that one thief, boy, he saw who Christ was. He saw who Christ was, and he says, remember me. Remember me. He looks over and he sees the brutalized Savior hanging on the cross and he says, remember me. Remember me. Jesus says, "Thou shalt today thou shalt be with me in paradise. Can I say something? For by grace are you saved through faith. Rejected grace. Notice with me secondly. We see the reminder of sacrifice. As we stand at the foot of the cross and we look this morning, we see a reminder of sacrifice. Notice with me verse 33. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me notice that darkness that darkness is, is night that's what that word would mean complete and utter darkness it was light one moment folks could see Christ hanging on the cross they could see these thieves and then the lights go out and then the lights go out I remember I've shared this illustration before when I was a teenager here at this church Paul and Judy took us to Linville Caverns it's the most dark place I've ever been in my life they take you to the very back of this place. And boy, you see trout swimming that are blind. I mean, it's, a, it's an incredible place to go. But they get you all the way to the back, and they cut the lights out. Completely dark. That's what was happening here. The lights were turned out. Some would say, oh, well, it was just an eclipse. There's no chance of that. It's Passover. We've got to understand what week we're in here. Full moon. No chance it was an eclipse. It's the work of God. God sees the sin that has been laid on his son, Jesus Christ. Not by his doing, by our doing. And he turned. And can I say something? Uh, the, the pain that Christ went through, the suffering that he went through, the hurt, the pain, the bleeding, all the things that led up pale in comparison to what he experienced in that moment in the darkness my friend I don't want anyone to ever experience that but if we continue in sin and we reject Jesus Christ there will come a day to where the hand of God will be gone and eternity will be spent in an eternal lake of burning where God and light is not present. So notice with me. Warren Wearsby states, The darkness at Calvary, what an announcement that God's firstborn and beloved son, the Lamb of God, was giving his life for the sins of the world. It was also an announcement that judgment was coming and men had better be prepared. What an announcement. As the world goes dark, as Jesus Christ hangs on the cross. Imagine seeing this. All the suffering of the cross, all the bloodshed, all the pain, all the torment, all the ridicule, the gasping of air that you're hearing. And then the lights go out, paled in comparison. We see Christ. He cries out, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Christ is suffering in that moment. The sins that you and I have committed Christ suffering for us notice uh, he, he was suffering here alone and can I remind us that sin separates us Christ didn't commit any of these sins but that sin caused a separation that day darkness fell upon, upon this earth the just for the unjust 1 Peter 3 18 for Christ also hath once suffered for sins the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God being put to death in the flesh but quickened by the Spirit. We'll go back to Isaiah 53. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God. 
his perfect son carrying the weight of humanity's sin. His sacrifice is something that we should never get over. It should be a constant reminder every day when we go out into our lives. His sacrifice ought to be on our mind. It ought to be on our mind. Notice in verses 35 and 36, it caused confusion, this sacrifice. They thought that uh, Elias was going to come, Elijah was going to come and, and pull him off the cross, but he's gone. Amen. He's gone. As we look back on the cross this morning, do we, do we see the reminder of the sacrifice? The pain he endured, the punishment he received, my friend, was mine, and it was yours. So we see the rejected grace. We see the reminder of sacrifice. Notice with me thirdly. Released access. Released access. Verse number 37. And Jesus cried out with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. Christ in his final moments on the cross expounded love. He's giving, he's pouring himself out for you and I in those moments. Notice his, his final moments, his final words, John records in 19, uh, chapter 19, verse 30. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. Thank the Lord for that. Listen, there's nothing that you and I can do to add to it. It's finished. It's finished. Luke 23, verse 46, Luke his account of the crucifixion and when Jesus had cried with a loud voice he said father into thy hands I commend my spirit and having said thus he gave up the ghost listen my friend it is finished the work the plan the suffering it is finished Christ willingly laid his life down he was not murdered he was not martyred he willingly gave himself for you and I John 10, verse number 11. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Verse 15. As the Father knoweth me, even so know I the Father, and I lay my life down for the sheep. Verse 17. Therefore doth my Father love me, because I lay down my life, that I might take it again. Praise the Lord for that, by the way. He said, I have the power to lay it down, and I have the power to take it again. Verse number 18, he said, no man take it from me, but I lay it down myself. In that moment, Mark records an amazing event that's going to transpire. Notice with me, notice with me. Verse number 38, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. As Christ calls out, it is finished. Something miraculous happens. Exodus 26, we see this veil, the importance of this veil and thou shalt rear up the tabernacle according to the fashion thereof which was showed thee in the mount. And thou shalt make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twin linen of cunning work with cherubims and shall be made. And thou shalt hang it upon the four pillars of shittim wood overlaid with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold upon the four sockets of silver. But notice in that moment this veil that was made that was 60 feet high and 30 feet wide about six inches thick in that moment ripped right down the middle the veil that had separated God from man from the holy to the holy of holies listen it's ripped it's torn in two notice with me how it was ripped from the top to the bottom only God only God could do such an event. It released access, access to God. In that moment, listen, my friend, we received access to the Father. Hebrews 10, 19, having therefore, brethren, boldness, to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. We ought to be thankful for that precious blood that he poured out for you and I by a new and living way which hath consecrated us through the veil that is to say his flesh and having an high priest over the house of God let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering for he is faithful 
that promise. In that moment, the veil was torn from top to bottom, and access was granted for you and I. My friend, through his sacrifice, you and I have access to God, access to God. That's a view that we can see from the foot of the cross. I, I think about, to make an application of this, I, I think about a COVID. You remember we were going through COVID and everything was shut down. And Walmart had some crazy, crazy situations, especially here in King. They had those cattle gates up. And Listen, even if you needed to pick something up from Walmart, you're waiting in line, sometimes 30 minutes waiting outside this place. But can I say you're waiting on access to be granted so you could go in for them to come up with accounts so you could walk through the doors. And as we make application to our life, it would be like a bulldozer coming through and knocking those doors down. We can go and come anytime we'd like. Jesus Christ did that with God, which is so much better. Anytime we need him, anytime we want to praise him, we can go to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Praise the Lord for this access. We see rejected grace. We've seen the reminder of sacrifice. We've seen the released access. Now notice with me we see realized salvation in verse number 39. Here as we are standing at the foot of the cross, we're looking around. We've seen the hurt. We've seen the pain. We've seen Jesus Christ make his final statements. Draw his last breath. Now notice with me verse 39. And when the centurion which stood over against him saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Notice this is an unanticipated realization. Think about this for just a moment. This is the centurion here. He is the captain. Listen, all these men who were brutalizing our Lord, all these men who were beating our Lord, all these men who drove the spikes in his hands, listen, he's over them. He's the boss man. And as he stands at the foot of the cross and he sees Jesus Christ hanging on that cross, he says, truly, this is the Son of God. Realized salvation. As he's in charge, he, he witnessed what the others had done. He witnessed the gasping of air. He witnessed the words, but yet he said, truly, truly. That word means of a truth without a doubt. There wasn't a doubt in this man's mind at that moment of who Jesus Christ is. And can I say something, friend? That ought to be our mindset as well. There should not be one doubt of who Jesus Christ is. He is the Son of God. There's no doubt. Now this man by himself could have been executed for make, making such a statement by the Romans. He could have been belittled. He could have been beat down. But yet he made this statement. Because he had that belief in his life. In this moment, he went from darkness to light. It has been said truly, this man was the son of God. This centurion saw Jesus for who he was. It is a picture of all who come to Jesus through the cross. At the cross, people see Jesus was the son of God. And this fulfills Jesus' promise. If I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The centurion saw many people crucified before. There's no doubt about that. He had had his hands a dirty many times crucifying people, but there was nobody like Jesus Christ he had ever met. And can I say in our life, there is no one like Jesus Christ. It is only him. Notice this man, he had a past. There's no doubt about it. But in that moment, he trusted. He leaned on. Christ. Have you ever stood at the foot of the cross and realized who's hanging there for you? I, I pray that you've been there. I pray that you've received Christ because my friend we're all just as rotten and dirty as this centurion. For all have sinned to come short of the glory of God. For all have sinned but God commendeth his love towards us and while we're yet sinners Christ died for us. Notice Luke's account, what Luke says here, these men as they're nailing him to the cross, as they beat him, he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. That's the love of our Savior. So you may be here this morning, maybe watching my live stream and say, listen, preacher, you're crazy. You don't know my background. You don't know where I've come from. You don't know where I grew up. You don't know what I've been involved in. It doesn't matter. 
Jesus Christ died for you just like he died for me, just like he died for every person sitting in this room this morning. His love, his love. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart, God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. This man said, surely this man is the Son of God. He believed in that moment. I realized salvation. We see the rejected grace, the reminder of sacrifice, the realized access, the realized or the released access, the realized salvation, and lastly and briefly, notice with me, resolute devotion. Verse number 40. There were also women. As, as we stand here at the foot of the cross now, let's, let's look. We've seen the brutality. We've seen the centurion make a decision in his life. Now let's look on the outer bands of Calvary here. Notice with me verse number 40. There were also women looking on afar off, among whom was Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of James, the less, and Joseph and Salome, who also, when he was in Galilee, followed him and ministered unto him and many other women which came up with him unto Jerusalem. In the week leading up to this event, where we find ourselves right now in Scripture, it has been a brutal week for our Lord. He has seen Judas betray him. We've mentioned he's seen Peter deny him. He's seen all his disciples flee in the garden. And now we see in Scripture there was a group of disciples who were there, who were looking on who were devoted to him. Listen, it didn't matter that if they were going to get caught and arrested, it didn't matter. They were devoted to Christ. And here they are standing, looking on at their Lord, their view from the foot of the cross along this hillside. That word look on, it means to view attentively. It means to make a survey. I want to ask you something this morning. We get times in life where we're hectic, times when we have work schedules times where things seem like it's coming off the rails but do we have this mindset like these disciples had these women look they were looking to Jesus Christ attentively devoted to him what about us we ought to have that same look they continued looking despite the situations going around now we got to understand as we look back to the cross he's not there anymore He's alive, my friend. But can I say something? The blood stains are still there. The pain is still there. He paid it all for you and I, my friend. Recently, recently, uh, we put a floor down in my daughter's bedroom. And uh, I'm not a great carpenter. I, listen, I, I get blood blisters and I, I can't, you know. A lot of times I use my thumb as a nail many times. Brother Shane saw it the first time I walked in. He said, wow, you must have really got your thumb. But I remember when I was putting this floor down in Sarah's bedroom, I cut my leg. Not a bad cut, but you, you all know, listen, I've been open and honest with you. You know I'm a little bit squeamish when it comes to blood, right? Well, as, as I'm on this, this wood floor, we're, we're putting down a laminate at the time. And boy, there was a spot of blood on the floor like that. And every time I looked at it, I, I was thinking about the, the incident. I was thinking about the pain because, listen, blood stains, by the way. But every time I looked at it, I thought about the, the situation and how I did it and, and what happened. Can I say every time we look at the cross, we ought to think about what he did for us. The blood stains that are there, the blood stains on the rocks, the blood stains that are, are listen, he washed us in his blood. We ought to think about the pain that it cost him for us. John, 1 John 1, 7. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth from all sin. There's power in the blood. And he shed it, my friend, for you and I. Matthew 26, 28. For this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sin. The writer of Hebrews says, And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. Without the shedding of blood is no remission. Jesus Christ did what he had to do for me and for you on Calvary's cross. 
It was shed for us, shed for our sins. 1 Peter 2, 21. For even here and too were you called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that you should follow in his steps. Here, as we think on these disciples, these women standing on the hillside, still following Christ, it ought to encourage us, friend, to keep on keeping on. Keep on looking to the cross for encouragement. Listen, that's where we got on. What a blessing it is. What a blessing it is. Look and live, my brother live. Look to Jesus now and live. Tis recorded in his word, hallelujah. It is only that you look and live. That we continue to look to the cross of Jesus Christ. Seeing what he done for us. May we be resolute in our devotion to Jesus Christ. As we close this morning. Our journey of hope took us on a road of presentation last week. And this week, as we make our journey of hope, we have stopped by the cross of Calvary. We, we've seen views from the foot of the cross. We've seen rejected grace. We've seen folks who just reviled our Lord. This morning, we've seen a reminder of sacrifice. We've seen the punishment that Christ went through for you and I as the lights went out. We've seen released access. We've seen that veil torn to where you and I, listen, any burden that you have, any burden that I have, we have access to God through Jesus Christ. We've seen a realized salvation here. This man realized who Christ was and believed in him. And lastly, we saw resolute devotion. We saw folks who were resolute to be devoted to God, to keep looking to the cross, and may we do that in our life. Friend, you may be here this morning and never realize the salvation that Jesus Christ has paid for you. I would encourage you today, trust Jesus Christ. Meet him at the foot of the cross this morning. Be the greatest day of your life. If you by faith would receive him as your Lord and as your Savior. Maybe you're like that centurion soldier. Maybe for the first time in your life today, you've realized who it is that hung on the cross and why he hung there. Maybe, friend, uh, uh, there's a, another issue in life. Maybe there's a burden in life. that, Listen, you've been holding it in with yourself. Listen, the veil's rent. Our Father's available. Would you take your need to Jesus Christ? He'll be your advocate with the Father. What a blessing that is. And maybe this morning, you're sitting here, maybe you just like to thank the Lord for what he did on the cross. Maybe this morning you'd like to thank the Father for sending the Son so that you and I can have salvation. Christ paid it all once and for all. Father, Lord, we love you today. Father, I pray you just help us now. As we think about views from the foot of the cross. Father, as we think about those who rejected Christ. Father, we think about that thief who reached out, called out to Christ. Father, there may be one here today that's in that same position. Never accepted Christ. Father, we pray your Holy Spirit would do the work this morning. Father, I'm finite. Father, all I can do is share your words. Father, we, we need you this morning. Father, would your Holy Spirit just move in this moment. And Father, we, we pray for the Christian this morning. Father, would we, we be encouraged by the cross, by the views that we've seen. Father, may we love you more today. Father, may we be moved to be more compassionate to be more caring, Father, to be more faithful to you. Father, you've been so faithful to us. Father, whatever the need is, Father, I pray we'd have courage to deal with it today. Lord, we love you. Lord, we certainly thank you for loving us. In Jesus' precious name, we do humbly pray. Amen. We'd like to thank you for joining us today on our live stream service. We pray that you were encouraged, that you were blessed, and that you were challenged by God's word. If we can be of any assistance to you, please feel free to reach us at our email below. We pray that you have a wonderful day, and God bless.